Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pod Scum. This is the podcast where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest waters with a wide array of legendary, that's right, legendary guests. I am, of course, your host, your bastard of ceremonies, the number one scumbag, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. Uh, you might also know me as the man with the golden voice and the velvet tongue ladies, a.k.a. the king of sleaze, a.k.a. the hair metal high priest, and most importantly, a.k.a. Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. That's right. Take a look. You're looking at the son of glam, the front man for the band. Just smoked a few grams, got a million fans. I'm your ice cream man, Mr. Wap Bop Loo Bop Wap Bang Bang. Shazam. God damn. Woo, let's get it on today. We got a legend. But before I get to that, a little product placement. If you too would like the locks that rock, get the product that does it all. Of course, this is the No Frills podcast. You don't get no frills because you get to look at me and you get plenty of thrills. And I am almost 50 years old and don't know shit about technology. So there's also that too. As always, I'm coming to you from the Pink Pussycat Lounge, the Den of Sin. And uh, as you know, I am the hardest working man in show business, not only bringing you this podcast, but fronting numerous glam and sleaze metal bands all up and down the eastern seaboard and uh allow me to invite my guest in here first of all let me give myself a look because today we actually have a glam metal star coming in here that's right star legend call him what you will but he the man that much we do know and i'm very excited to finally hook up with him and have him so while we wait from here, let me just let you know about uh, my various bands, with most of my focus currently being on Love Sword. Virtuoso players out there, if you're looking for a band and you're looking for a front man, I digress. The front man, get your act together, audition, send me tapes, hit me up in the message section because nobody does it better. Well, one man does it better. That's Pops back there. Other than that, you're looking at the greatest front man. Speaking of that, here is our guest that we will welcome to Pod Scum here. And I'm excited about this. I really am. Greg, how are you, buddy? Hey there. How are you, man? Good to see you. Is my, is my hair 80s enough? Your hair sounds fabulous. My hair sounds fabulous. Well, well, <laughs> well, I am a chip off the old block. As you can see, I got a picture of the old man back here. You may have That's crossed true. paths with him a few times in your career, no? Once or twice. I'm in Dave. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the DNA testing, not conclusive yet, but I mean, I, it's going to pop out. You know, Dave's got no kids, or so he thinks. Uh -huh. But he does have a son here in upstate New York. But listen, Greg D'Angelo, uh, <laughs> formerly of White Lion, in my mind, a legend. I always tell my audience, that's all I deal with on here are legends. You're a legend, buddy. You're a oh, legend. That's very kind. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but um, specifically, I want to talk about, uh, here's something I don't think a lot of people will know in my audience, though, because I think they will remember you a lot from the White Lion years, but you were originally a member of Anthrax. I was. That's right. Now, how does that happen? How do you go from a thrash band like Anthrax into playing uh, into playing a, 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 in a band like White Lion? Well, you know, um, I joined Anthrax when I was 17 years old. Okay. Uh, um, I met Scott Ian through uh, a mutual friend, the, uh, the lead guitar player in the band at the time. And, uh, in fact, I remember going – I've told the story before, but I remember going down to uh, Toys R Us in Douglas and Queens where he worked. Yep. And he was walking up and down the aisles in his Toys R Us vest. And uh, <laughs> we chatted. He was a nice guy, all full of smiles, and uh, asked me if I would come down and play. And I said, sure. And I went down, and uh, it gelled. And I really liked Scott. And uh, and uh, he was doing things. He was uh, making moves. So I said, sure, let's, let's do this. Let's check it out. And, What's more uh, metal than somebody being in a Toys R Us vest, right? That's metal right there. Very metal. Yeah. There are some very metal toys. Yeah, days. it sure yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, back then there were. But yeah. So so why not stay with uh, Anthrax, though? Like, what led to the uh, short stint with Anthrax? Well, you know, there was a band, there were a bunch of bands playing around town in New York at the time, and it was this band called Cities, and they had a really fantastic guitar player, probably um, the best guy uh, in the scene at our level at that point, this guy named Steve Moranovich. 
and I really wanted to play with him. I thought it was going to make me a better musician, which it did. Right. Um, I, so he was in a band called Cities. So I left Anthra Anthrax to join Cities. And, um, you know, I really believe that during that period of uh, my journey, I, I became a better musician. And really, that's what I was looking to do. Yeah. So um, 85, um, uh, you join uh, White Lion. Um, I think a lot of people would be under the misconception because so many bands were coming from that L.A. Sunset Strip scene. But White Lion initially is a New York-based band, correct? Straight out of Brooklyn. Straight out of Brooklyn. Um, so uh, um, how do you make the connection with uh, the guys in White Lion? Do you audition for them? Do they see you play somewhere? How do you meet Mike Tramp and, uh, and, and the guys that would go on to be the version of White Lion that you were in? It's interesting. I mean, I was aware of them for a very long time. Um, and uh, from what their management told me, they were aware of me as well. Okay. I think I was one. I think I was one of the last guys to go into play. They saw hundreds of drummers from what they told me. Um, but um, I showed up, uh, played the songs. Um, they liked what they heard. They asked me to come back and uh, and learn a few more songs. I did that. They asked me to come back with my kit. I did that. And uh, after about, about the third round, um, they offered me the gig. What do you think so, it was? Uh, did they ever tell you, uh, you know, out of the hundreds of people that they were uh, auditioning, did they tell you, you know, what led them to deciding on you? You know, I think it was just probably a combination of a lot of things, you know, um, the way I played, probably the way I looked to a certain degree. Right. Um, my, uh, my attitude. You know, yeah. I, I'm sure there were a, a lot of things that they were looking at that, uh, you know, helped in their decision, you know. Now, now you also played on uh, 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 Stephen Piercy's, uh, I believe it was his first solo album, Smash. Um, was that his first solo album? I, I, know I think I think that was his first uh, solo album, but uh, it, it was either. I, he's, I think he's only put out uh, the two of them. So, um, but uh um, is he somebody that you go back a long time with and have a good relationship with? How, uh, uh, what leads you to working with Stephen? Um, oddly enough, yeah, Stephen and I have a very good relationship. Um, I've known him since the 80s. Um, and uh, he lived in my neighborhood. And I was walking to get my mail one day and he was watering his roses or something in his front yard. And uh, just walked by and said, hey. And he said, hey. And we just got to chatting. And he asked me if I was interested in doing something. And I said, sure, and went through a couple of perm, perm, permutations, permute, hmm, what's that word? Anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, permutations, permutations. Yes, there you go. And, there you um, go. That sounds right to me. <laughs> and uh, eventually he asked me to join his band, and I did. And I did it for about uh, about five or six years. I played with Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you're exposing these guys as non-metal, though. Scott Ian in the Toys R Us vest, Stephen Piercy watering his roses. I love that we get to see these guys as regular human beings. You know what I mean? That's that, that's what it's all about right there, though. I mean, well, you know. We're just as God made us. Right, right. So, um, uh, now, I know that you're doing a lot of, uh, uh, you do a lot of studio work right now and a lot of producing, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff right now. You like that more than you like actually being out on the stage and performing? Uh, you know, these days, I really, like, these days I like performing more. I have a band called Legends of Classic Rock. Yep. And with um, with a, a bunch of famous guys. And um, we do uh, all kinds of gigs. We were in Europe all summer. Just got back about a week ago. And I apologize. That's why it took me so long. No, no worries. No worries. I know. But, We've been uh, keeping in contact and stuff. Yeah. But, um, but um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a feature band. And uh, we have a great time playing. And uh, I think I've done, I don't know, maybe about 100 dates with the band this year so far. It's, yeah. been, it's been a great year for us. Now, as somebody who's toured the world, and as you say just now, just coming back from Europe, I'm always intrigued. I like to get musicians' uh, uh, you know, takes on this who are on here. What are the differences that you see in the European audiences and, and how they receive uh, you know, the hard rock, heavy metal, you know, because they just seem to get it a little more over there. I don't know what it is, but I mean, do you get that sense from the European audiences? You know, I get that sense from, from um, a lot of the places we play. It's Europe, it's the United States. You know, I think a lot of people um, are really hungry to see live music again. It's been sure. such a tough couple of years that, um, you know, everybody wants to go out and wants to have a good time, as do we. That's right. why we started playing again. We really wanted to get out there and have some fun. And um, we have been, luckily. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't really draw a line between the European audiences 
and the American audiences. I think anybody that shows up really wants to be there right. and really wants to enjoy the music. Now, do you, um, uh, you know, I know over the years there's been speculations that have swirled around. Uh, I think they've finally been put to bed now, at least uh, from what I hear out of the Mike Tramp uh, uh, camp, that there will ne never be a white lion reunion with the original members. I hate to, you know, you hate to, you hate to say never, but does it seem like it'll ever come to fruition with so many bands right now reuniting? Everything that was old becomes new again. There's always an excitement. Um, uh, but, but are we past that point with white lion? Uh, I don't know. The older people get, I guess, the more unlikely it becomes as time yeah. goes on. But yeah, I never, I know, I'll never say never. You know, I mean, if the situation was right for everyone, I'm sure uh, we would look at it. Are you in contact with any of the White Lion guys? Yeah, I'm in contact with uh, all of them to varying degrees. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, so, what do you think about? Because uh, I'm actually going to be uh, going uh, tomorrow to see Megadeth play. Now, James Lomenzo is currently in that version of Megadeth. Um, uh, uh, do you like him as a fit in that band? He's a, such a great player. Um, as long as he's happy and he's having a good time doing it, you know, he's got all the blessings that he needs. More power know? to him. Yeah. Um, so what's it like being a counselor for this rock and roll fantasy camp? Is that something that you really enjoy? You talk to me a little bit about mentoring people and just, you know, having them glean wisdom from you and passing along everything that you've learned. Uh, rock and roll fantasy camp just seems like a, a real hoot for the people that are involved in it. It's a great time. It's a, you know, it's, it's great to, uh, to, uh, interact with, uh, the people that, uh, that, that come out and want to, uh, involve themselves with that. Um, it's a real unique, fun thing to do, and I would recommend it to anybody that wants to do it. And it's a great opportunity to uh, interact with a lot of my peers that I don't normally get to see. You know, that's a big bonus, I think, for all of us sure. that uh, get to be counselors. You know, we get to kind of impart some of our uh, information. when I mean, we get to see sides of uh, other musicians that we wouldn't normally get to see. So selfishly, it's, uh, it's a good thing all the way around. How do you get hooked up with something like that? They approach you. Do you express interest in it? Uh, my buddy, Tony Franklin, uh, turned me on to that. And, um, yeah, he brought me in. And uh, I am very thankful for him doing so. So um, uh, uh, talk to me a little bit about, uh, since you're doing this uh, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, talk to me a little bit about um, – who are the guys uh, as drummers, uh, you know, that you, I don't want to use the word influence because, because yeah, that's, it seems like it's always worded that way, but who are guys who play the drums uh, specifically that that's your instrument? Who are the guys that you look at and, and just admire as players, you know, and just love their playing? Oh God, there are so many great drummers out there and so many guys that I admire. I, you know, uh, I mean, uh, to go way back, it's all the uh, 70s English guys, Bonham. You sure? Um, uh, Cozy Powell, Ian Pace, Simon Kirk. Um, but um, there's uh, current drummers that uh, I listen to that I think are really fantastic. I think uh, um, Jojo Mayer is, is great. Um, uh, Tommy Igo plays great. Yep. Um, um, I really like how uh, Ray Luzier plays, the uh, yep. drummer from Corn. He's a great yep. drummer. Um, who else? I know I'm, I'm leaving out so many guys that, that, that I'll say, Oh, I should have said that guy. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of great drummers out there and, uh, it's, it's really incredible. I mean, just the, the, the capabilities of some of the young guys that I've seen on YouTube and some of, you know, they're doing stuff that 20 years ago we would I be know. like, what I know. was going on? It's crazy. Well, well, now your stint with uh, your stint with White Lion uh, ended uh, 1991. That's right. Um, when when and obviously the 80s, very well known for its music, very well known for you know lots of bands coming out of that uh, out of that LA scene. Um, what happened when the 90s hit? I mean, what was the general consensus of people like you and people around you when kind of the grunge movement kind of moved in? Like, did it seem like, you know, was that music that you were, you know, that you were you were digging? Or did you see it as like, uh, uh oh, this is really going to rain on the parade of what of the style that, that I do or that we do collectively as musicians in that scene? Um, you know, it didn't bum me out so much. I really liked Nirvana. I thought that was a great band. I thought that guy wrote great songs. Yeah. Just great, great, great songs. Um, and, uh, I love the production, you know, I love the, the, the sound of, uh, 
that uh, generation of music. I always thought that um, a lot of the stuff that we did in the 80s was too wet, too digital, too too much, you know, reverb, right. too much too much lexicon, you know, that kind of stuff. I was sure, never sure. really a big fan of that kind of stuff. We started to get out of it a little bit with our last record where our, our sounds became a little bit more natural, I, and I preferred that. Um, but I never thought that um, the grunge movement kind of stole our thunder. It was right. a different. It was really a different thing, you know. And and fads change, and generations want their own thing that they can identify with. And I could understand that. But the irony to me was that I always saw saw that the big shows, the big heavy metal, hair metal, rock shows, went to the country market. You know, I remember sure. watching a, a Garth Brooks video uh, in the early '90s and going, "Well, there it is. There's there's all the uh, you know the streamers and and right. and, the, and the bombs and and right. uh, and the flares and everything. That's where the big light show, right? You right. Know, where grunge was pulling everything back. Our show just went to Tennessee. Right, right, right. So, so, um, uh, so, where do you think though? Like, when you look back at the at the pantheon of all those great bands, and and certainly, you know, me being forty nine years old, uh, you know, I was a teenager in the eighties. You know, you I have fond remembrances of Motley Crue and Def Leppard and Rat, and you, you know, of course, White Lion, White Snake, and just you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. Where do you think White Lion? Uh, where does their legacy? fit in there because obviously some fantastic songs you guys had a great uh you know it just seemed like all the ingredients were there uh you know a great look uh super handsome front man if i might say mike tramp very good looking guy with a lot of talent all you guys you know you guys had the look you had the songs um uh, where do you put yourself wow um i don't know i guess we were you know we were a part of that moment we were uh you know, we were lucky enough to uh, have some really good accomplishments uh, with our records and our tours and uh, very fortunate. Um, uh, I really feel blessed to have uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to to do what we did and meet some of our heroes and play with some of our heroes. And, sure. um, and uh, you know, and to obviously have made somewhat of an impact because people are still calling to talk to me. So. Sure. I guess they, I guess they liked what we did. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, I, and forgive me for not knowing which album it was on, but you guys did a cover of Golden Earrings, R R Radar Love. When you, when a band sits down and, and makes a conscious decision to put a cover on there, uh, uh, is that like a collaborative thing? You know, the, is it put to a vote? How do you guys How do you guys arrive at that particular song? Obviously, that's not a very obvious song that uh, that you know that uh, you know for uh, for a band in that era uh, to cover. It, you know, it's kind of one that seemed like you guys kind of dug deep and kind of uh, you, uh, you know threw a curveball at us. Great selection, by the way. Um, you know, certainly not a song that you hear covered by a lot of people. How do you arrive at that though? Who makes that call? Well, it was a very natural thing for us. We used to. Uh kind of jam on that on that verse groove uh during sound checks okay uh back in the day and um just got to the point where we were getting ready to do this next record and we talked about doing a cover and one of us said well what about doing uh you know radar love and then we looked at it a little harder we worked up a version of it and it worked out but um it was a very natural process now a guy that i find very fascinating and i think it's because he seems like he's dropped off the off the radar. Although you say you're still in touch with a lot of the guys, but just a phenomenal, phenomenal player is Vito. It's almost like a Where's Waldo book. Where's Vito? Like Where's Vito? Vito's around. Vito Vito's is around. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is, is, is Vito doing anything from a musical standpoint, though? I, I don't think he's doing anything from a musical standpoint right now. I think he, you know he uh, he uh, might have picked up the guitar and started playing a little bit again. I hope he has. Um, you know some limited conversation that we've had it led me to believe that he was at least looking at it um but he's got responsibilities and uh you know that uh uh take priority for him and right. um that's what he's doing with his life and uh you know and uh i think that if he wants to play there's certainly uh, uh avenues for him to do so and um you know that's going to be his decision when when I, I read a couple of interesting articles when I was making uh, s some notes and some stuff I want to talk to you about on here, um, what 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 where do you stand on uh, people that would say that uh, apart from a lot of your peers that White Lion 
um, added political elements uh, to, to your music. You agree with that statement? I, I, I obviously I, I'm looking here. Uh, you know, "Cry for Freedom." Um, you know, certainly touched on uh, apartheid. Uh, El Salvador, uh, broken home, dealing with divorce, little fighter. Um, uh, did, did you guys make a conscious decision? A conscious decision amongst yourselves, and 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 how active were you guys back then? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, how serious did you approach? Uh, so, you know, social slash political issues. Well, um, Mike chose the uh subject matter and mike wrote the lyrics okay the song so it was really mostly his decision um and, and um and that was fine um uh i think some of the songs uh you know probably gained a little bit more credibility due to the seriousness of of, of the lyrical content um but uh, as far as uh choosing what subject matter to write about that was mike's call and okay. um, really probably more a question for him, um, honestly. Was there any pushback from the band, though, to kind of say, like, hey, come on, this is kind of putting a damper on. This music's about, you know, kind of like about having fun and stuff like that. Maybe we shouldn't write about stuff that's so heavy. Or were you guys kind of all on board with with, with whatever he chose to write? You know, we really I, I don't think we really thought about it so much. It was we were so concerned about making sure our performance was good and the music was good that you know the lyrics kind of came after we had worked up the arrangements for uh the musical side of things um sometimes we heard them very late in the game and it was just like oh that's pretty cool yeah i see where you're going with that and right. and, it, and it was never there was never an issue where uh you know he got pushed back because we weren't talking about chicks and getting loaded and all that kind of stuff. And yeah you know yeah it just yeah. it just wasn't in our uh it just wasn't in our uh purview really now obviously uh, you, you know we could probably spend hours and hours on, and hours on here rehashing probably like you know cr you know crazy road stories or whatever without getting into too much about that who is a band that you really enjoy touring with not even for like the partying aspect or having any wild times but you know who is somebody that white lion another band that white lion really felt a camaraderie with that you guys yeah you specifically even not even speaking on behalf of the other guys but somebody that you enjoy touring with uh, all of them really i mean uh you know, we were lucky enough to do about a month with Kiss. They were the first band to yep. take us out on a major tour. Uh, they were idols of mine uh, when I was a kid. Sure. And, um, you know, I was honestly a bit starstruck when uh, when, yeah. we, when we got to do that. So for me, that was a that was a real big deal. And then we went to Aerosmith, which was kind of like uh, just unbelievable. Swinging from one legend to another. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty, yeah. That, yeah. That, 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 that is pretty crazy. Yeah, you that's, know, I mean, that's you walk into work and Steven Tyler says, Hey Greg, how you doing, man? I know, I you know. know. Mind blowing. Like, yeah, totally mind blowing. I, I don't get to walk into work to that. I, I I work by day as a nurse, so I get to walk into uh, you know, blood and sick people and stuff like that. So I would love to walk in and have Steven Tyler say, Hey, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good day at the office. It's um, it's pretty it was pretty cool, I have to say. Now, so what's the endeavor that you're working on now that you talked about at the top of the interview? Uh um the legends of classic rock okay. L -O the website is l o c r b a n d dot com okay and who's part of this project with you who are the legends involved in this uh terry loose from great white is, okay. is is my partner it's it's my and his band we and uh we're lucky we have uh chuck wright from quiet riot nice. playing bass and we have jason boylson from uh bad company and jefferson starship playing guitar and we have kevin jones from ozzy osbourne's band playing keys and what is the uh, what was the impetus for getting all you guys together? Who reaches out to who in that scenario? Because obviously you guys are all you know pretty big heavyweights at your individual positions. Who reaches out and makes that connection and kind of assembles you guys all together? Well, Terry and I have been friends for you know 30, 35 years, and uh, we met one night at a, a a local jam here in Los Angeles that actually Chuck. Uh, managed and owns um called the ultimate jam night down at the whiskey okay. and um so chuck had invited the two of us down just coincidentally and uh you know and i hadn't seen terry in a long time so we caught up and at the end of the night we said hey why don't we think about doing something and so that turned into this and and um so what is the goal 
uh, like with this band? Like, will you guys record music? Is this just something that you guys are going to take out live and just, uh, you know, perform for people? Or, uh, you know, are you guys going to get in the studio and, and make an album? It's a performance band at this point. That's our okay. primary, that's our primary focus. Um, we're doing, um, same kind of venues that, uh, most, most of our, uh, contemporaries are doing sheds, packs, but, you know, performance art centers yep. and, uh, all other kinds of gigs. You know? Now, obviously, now obviously, uh, you know, over the course of your career, uh, you, you know, from when you started to now, hu huge, and I talk about this with other musicians on here too, huge, epic shifts and changes in the music business. Um, uh, how has it affected you personally? Like now, obviously, you know, I, I hear the same story from a lot of musicians on here, you know, yeah. I, I obviously, you know, trying to find commercial success or make money or, or just, it's gotta be a very frustrating, daunting road for musicians right now. I mean, so certainly technology has its advantages, but it seemed like it's, uh, it, it's, it's put a damper on some things in the music business. How specifically has, has where we are now affected you or has um, it? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I know I said, or has it, or has it affected you? Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, guided our, our choices as far as what we're going to do um, professionally. And, uh, you know, that said, it, our, our focus is really more on performance than uh, making records or anything like that um, right. at, at this point. Um, and luckily for us, we've been busy. So it's, it's occupied a lot of our time as well. It doesn't really leave a lot of time Right. to make a record and, and honestly the financial aspects of making a record these days don't make that much sense for us no no you I'm know hearing so, it more and more i know you know if we could go out and do a couple of shows and make the same money why would i spend six weeks making a record or eight weeks making a record right you know plus writing and all that kind of stuff so you know for us it's it's really more about going out and playing and, and having fun and and kind of uh you know doing a victory lap for right, want of a right. better description sure. and, and yeah. you know, having a good time. So at this stage of your career, um, in, in this stage of your life, what is touring like? Are these, are, are these like flyaway dates? Like this isn't like, you know I mean? Like taking this out for weeks and months at a time, right? This is going out and doing like isolated dates here and there. Primarily. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to see the back of a tour bus anymore, right? Sleeping on those rolling, uh, rolling caskets anymore, right? Those yeah, days are so over. Much. Yeah, no, not, <laughs> not so, so much, much for, anymore. Now, yeah. are you still, are you still a New York based guy? No, no, I've been in Los Angeles since the eighties. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Do you ever get back to the East Coast at all? Mm, infrequently, when I play. Now, what are the differences that you see being an East Coast guy, being out there for as long as you have? Have you managed to find uh, a lot of the things that you used to love about New York and the East Coast out there? Can you find good pizza, for instance? You can find good pizza. You can find good pizza. So all, yeah. all, the, all, all the trappings of home back here on the East Coast, you're able to find out there? For the most part, yeah. That's pretty yeah, good. That's pretty part, good. Yeah. I guess you're doing all right then, right? I got no complaints. So um, are you one of those kind of guys who, uh, uh, when you're doing this uh, th this Legends band, are you the kind of guy that likes to have a full plate and juggle multiple projects, or do you put all your focus just into this right now? Do you have other endeavors that you're doing right now? We've got a couple of things that we're, that we're thinking about doing, but um, as I said before, you know, Legends takes up such a, um, such a great amount of time out of my day that uh, um, I find myself really just spending a lot of time managing the band and, and making sure everything is where it's supposed to be and uh you know making sure that our calendar is full is there music because i know that this is a is a very tough for me uh being almost 50 years old uh where i don't feel like i'm stuck in a time warp all the time and leaning heavily on the bands of the past but are there any new bands out there that are uh, impressing you or that have caught your attention to make you say like wow rock and roll is in good hands you know what i mean there's people that take the torch and run with it uh, there's a couple of bands that I like. I mean, um, I really like Rival Sons. I think they're a great band. I think they're really original. Yep. Um, but but they've been around for a long time now. Um, as far as anything kind of newer than that, um, I'm I'm a little deficit. I have to say, I'm not really <laughs> up on, on on you know. I still listen yeah. to my Led Zeppelin and my Bad Company records. You know, that's yeah. where my head is at. Yeah, I'm guilty of that also. And uh, um uh. Throughout these past couple of years, uh, uh, how have uh, the, uh, these current times, uh, how have they treated you and your family uh, as far as like uh, COVID? Did you stay healthy through it all? 
stayed healthy through it all. Yeah, I had it once. I had COVID once or twice. Uh, it kind of was a, a light hit for me. Me too. Um, um, luckily, knock on wood. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but um, uh, you know, it's funny. I was telling my wife that uh, for the first six months, when, we, when the whole world locked down, it was kind of uh, reinforcing to know that we got along and my family is really yeah. solid and, yeah. uh, and uh, we could survive. Uh, yeah, you know, under the same roof and quarantine. Or whatever yeah, it is, that's you know? pretty. Yeah, that's pretty scary sometimes. Like when you're thinking of being quarantined with somebody, I, you know, especially when it actually comes down to actually happening. Like, okay, now we're going to be trapped here together, and uh, that's right. I guess we'll find out what we're really made of here. Could have um, been a lot worse. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, um, moving forward, um, uh, anything else on your plate other than the legends thing, anything that you see upcoming? No, right now legends, uh, is again, is my primary focus. Um, um, you know, I do other things here and there, but nothing, uh, that, uh, I, I you know, stuff that I get hired to do, but nothing, right. um, nothing primary. Um, I would tell everybody to look at L O C R B A N D.com. Uh, follow me on my Instagram, Greg. D'Angelo authorized or, or right. follow me on Facebook. And um, there's um, legends of classic rock pages uh, on Instagram and Facebook and all that for that as well. And that's the best way to keep it uh, in touch with what I'm doing. Awesome. Let me just ask you um, uh, real quick. Um, in light of the fact uh, that uh, some of your peers, uh, the aforementioned kiss, uh, obviously the big stadium tour that's going on as a player uh, who's had a long career himself, uh, do guys, when they get to a certain, uh, status, like your Paul Stanley's or your Vince Neal's, do those guys get a pass when they're using these tricks that everyone is claiming that they're using backing vocals and, and this and that, where people are accusing it of not being an authentic, uh, live performance. Where do you stand on that? Go see the show, have a good time and don't tell musicians how to produce their show. They're just trying to make the best show they can for you. I and couldn't agree with you more. It, it shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be any uh, judgment. Nobody's looking for notes. Right, right, right. And 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 plus, I mean, you know, who can replicate like what they could do forty years ago? I defy anybody to try to do you know, or try to do or be what they were forty years ago. I mean, you're just not the same person anymore. You know, if you need right. stuff to and you know enhance where you are in life, you know, I think fans need to understand that they have to meet these artists. You know, where they are at this point in their career. You know, I mean, you, you know. I don't think Steven Tyler is going to hit the high notes and dream on anymore. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, who could, it's very, very difficult, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, that's life. That's life. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate uh, you uh, being so generous with your time. It was great talking to you. I'm glad we were finally able to make this happen. I uh, wish you all the you luck too. in the world with all your future endeavors and uh, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we can do this again somewhere on down the road. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Greg. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day, buddy. Bye now. All right. Later. And there he goes, folks. A real life legend right there. That is Greg D'Angelo. You know him. You love him. You probably mostly know him from his stint in the legendary 80s band White Lion. If you don't, go back and check him out because he can pound them skins, boy. Let me tell you that much. And uh, it was a real pleasure having him on. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that episode of Pod Scum. Do go check out all the sites that he mentioned, uh, the project that he's doing uh, with all these legends of rock and roll. Uh, go back and explore the White Lion catalog. Uh, you will find and unearth some great music in there with great players. Um, and so I implore you to do that. Support everything that Greg D'Angelo is doing. Uh, go back and check them out on all those sites that he mentioned. And uh, until next time on Pod Scum, remember to take it easy and keep it sleazy.